Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees this afternoon to this, the webinar on the South African energy transition journey with Andy Carlitz of Future Energy. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence, together with Sassel, Standard Bank, and Future Energy. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. I will be your Master of Ceremonies and Moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. Uh, may I extend a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. A big welcome also to Andy Carlitz in London, who will deliver the presentation. And finally, a big welcome to Dr. Crispian Olver, Executive Director of the Presidential Climate Commission, to Priscilla Mabalani, Executive Vice President, Energy Business at Sassel, and to Rentia van Tonder, Head of Power, Corporate and Investment Banking at Standard Bank. Crispian, Priscilla and Rentier will provide some of their own insights and will in turn pose a key question to Andy, who will then respond to each in turn with a short presentation. After the Paris Agreement, every country has embarked on an energy transition journey to reconfigure its energy supply system and demand in order to reduce its environmental and climate impact, whilst ensuring energy security and access, affordable energy prices, and workable tax burdens for its citizens. That energy transition journey is unique to each country. In its energy transition journey, South Africa, as an important BRICS country, with a large economy in Africa, and with a carbon footprint that stands out like a sore thumb, has its own specific energy transition journey ahead. In the face of this, Andy Carlitz, CEO of Future Energy, will present five key opportunities in dealing with the energy transition in South Africa. And he is here also to deal with and answer some of the questions and issues arising. Just over 2,200 delegates have registered to attend this webinar uh, to hear what Crispian Olver, Priscilla, Rentia and Andy have to say on the subject. At this point, may I publicly thank Sassel, Standard Bank and Future Energy most sincerely for the support that EE Business Intelligence has received from them in hosting this webinar. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to view the webinar on demand and to download all presentations will be made available shortly to all those that have registered to attend, as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Zoom Q&A text facility. If time permits, I may also take verbal questions from those that put up their hands to ask questions. So we have set aside 20 minutes after the presentation for Andy, Priscilla and Rentier uh, to answer just some of your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, which is short, I am not going to read out the biographies of Dr. Crispian Olver, Priscilla Mabalani, Rentier van Tonda and Andy Carlitz. Instead, I'm going to share a link on the chat facility which you can click on to download their short form biographies. So do keep your eyes out open on that uh, chat facility uh, where you will see this link uh, in order to view the bios of the presenters. So at this point, may I now call on Dr. Crispian Olver, Executive Director of the Presidential Climate Commission, to say a few words and to pose the first question to Andy Carlitz for his response. Crispian, welcome and over to you. Uh, morning, Chris, and uh, very good morning to uh, everyone on the webinar. It's great to be able to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, I, I must say, uh, this, the, the topic of this webinar immediately caught my attention. Um, 
and for those of you that aren't familiar, the, the, the Presidential Climate Commission was set up by Cyril Ramaphosa a year ago, um, uh, basically to plan our country's pathway to a net zero economy roughly around mid-century. And uh, for any of you who are familiar with the climate debate, you'll know that uh, the most critical part of that transition is the energy transition. Um, and we, we come from you know, a highly fossil fuel dependent and very emissions intensive economy. Uh, that's been a great asset to us uh, for decades because it's allowed to produce some of the cheapest electricity in the world and to, you know, put the baseload power into running, uh, you know, our industrial systems and the rest of our economy. Um, but it's also a massive liability as we go forward. And uh, you know, a lot of our trading partners are now looking to go net zero themselves. Um, uh, the developed countries are uh, a few steps ahead of us. They've been building up uh, very strong renewable energy dominant systems. Um, and as they make this adjustment, they're looking to uh, stop what I would, they're, they're, they're um, taking steps to prevent other countries' emissions being imported into their economy. So you, you may have been following the European Union, they're uh, working on what they call the carbon border uh, tax adjustment. Uh, that'll be coming into place from 2023. Um, uh, other countries are looking at similar measures, but one way or another, there is a global carbon price being injected into, into the trading system and the global economy. And for South Africa, that's a serious market risk, uh, which means that we do need to adjust. We do need to start the transition. Um, and I think all stakeholders are broadly aligned about that. I mean, I mean, even, you know, the Minister for Mineral Resources and Energy will acknowledge that there is a transition underway. Um, there's a very active debate going on in South Africa at the moment about what the pace of that transition should be. So how fast uh, do we decommission coal? Um, you know, how do we put the, the renewables onto the system to compensate for that decommissioning? What's the role of grid balancing? Um, and particularly gas, there's a very active debate at the moment around the use of gas. Um, uh, as a as a you know peaking peaking fuel, um, so you know these are these are critical issues for us as a country. The, 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 in many ways, the debate about the energy transition is very live. It's a very political debate. Uh, there are big economic interests uh, at stake, and uh, you know the future of our development path uh, is at stake as well. This is. This, this cuts to the very heart of our economy and our development as a people. So uh, that's all to say, uh, I'm listening to this debate with a lot of interest. Uh, I'd be particularly interested uh, to hear from Andy about the experience of other countries as they go through this transition. So, you know, what are the, what are the key take home lessons for us as South Africa from other parts of the world about how to navigate these energy transitions and to make these very difficult choices as we move forward. So uh, that's it for me, Chris. Uh, uh, very good to be with you. Congratulations on pulling this together, a crucial debate for our country. So I look forward to listening. Thank you very much, uh, Chris Bien. And I take it, Andy, you've heard the question uh, from uh, Christian, and it's really about uh, what are other countries doing and how are they dealing with the challenges of the energy transition? And we'd be very keen to hear your response to that question uh, from Christian. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Christian. And Chris, uh, yes, every country in the world is undergoing an energy transition and everyone is facing its own opportunities, its own challenges, and its own dilemmas where it may, needs to make difficult trade-offs. 
And um, let's visit briefly 13 countries to see some of those contradictions and, and, and how, how they are tackling uh, that uh, uh, as in, in their energy transition. On, on screen, you can see the Australian energy transition headlines. Uh, we don't have time to go through that in detail. That is 30 minutes on Australia by itself. But I'm going to look at two parts. On the one hand, uh, Australia is exporting more coal than any other country. And that's the link to South Africa amidst international criticism of that, but continuing to do so. But it's also aspiring to be a new energy superpower exporting renewable power and hydrogen and ammonia to, to Asia. And on screen, you can see the, the big coal export terminals, each of those red dots in Australia on the, on the Queensland coast and New South Wales coast. And let's go to the town called uh, Newcastle, where you see the world's largest coal export terminal as part of Australia. And you can see the Hunter River. You can see the, uh, the Carrington Coal Terminal and, and also the, uh, the, the, the second coal terminal exporting more coal to, to Japanese steel mills than, than any other country in the world. At the other end of the Australian spectrum, we see this picture. And what you see from uh, looking down from space is the Suiso Frontier, which is the, just uh, delivered the first uh, cargo of blue liquid hydrogen from Hastings. You can see bottom, uh, bottom map of where Hastings is to, from Australia to Japan. And that uh, was, in a sense, a historic moment. We go to South America and we look at uh, what is specifically happening in the powerhouse of the economy of, of Brazil, uh, where uh, they are simultaneously developing the big offshore oil fields, uh, but also importing gas and energy to back up the country, which is more reliant on hydroelectricity than any other country. And uh, on your screen, you can see the, 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 the offshore area, like uh, uh, South Africa has an offshore that Brazil is currently developing, putting a large number of big production platforms through Petrobras uh, into the sea to make sure that it can export its oil to Asia. Whilst at the other end, as is the discussion in South Africa, you can see the, the port of Aku uh, on the Brazilian coast where an LNG carrier has brought in some LNG and it is being regasified so that it can go into a local power plant uh, in, in Brazil. We move north to, to Canada. And again, you can see the Canadian very active G7 country in terms of its energy transition. But it stands out, it is the largest oil exporter within the G7 and it's producing seven, 4 million barrels of oil a day from oil sands but it is also running the world's largest hydro, hydrogen plant. Let's first go to the province of Alberta in the Canadian West. And we look down on the famous oil sands of Fort McMurray. And there you can see the town of, from space, the town of Fort McMurray. You can see how the top soil has been removed uh, and how our oil is being through steam or chemicals being, being drained out of the sand uh, and with big tailing dams left behind before restoration eventually producing 4 million barrels of oil a day, very significant. But we move to the Canadian East Coast to the province of Quebec. And from space, we look down on that room there in Bécancour, uh, where the world's largest hydrogen facility is now in operation. And you can see the hydrogen storage tank. Uh, and looking inside that building, what do we see? You can see the three big, uh, four big Ehrlichid hydrolyzers that uh, now produce uh, uh, more hydrogen per year in green hydrogen from hydroelectricity than any other facility in the world. And that's what, for probably for most people on this call, for the first time, see what a, 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 a hydrogen electrolyzer looks like. You can see Ehrlichid in one of, of those units in, in front of us. We move to the country most talked about probably in terms of the energy transition, which is China. Headlines on screen, we don't have time to look at all of that, but let's look at two things that China is doing. On the one hand, it is continuing to expand coal power. And with a clear statement from the Chinese Communist Party and President Xi, that economic progress will not be constrained by energy availability. But it is also doing so much in terms of its energy transition Let's look at two things happening in China. 
The red dots on screen are all the large coal-fired plants, uh, each the size of Madupi, each the size of Kusile, that have been built recently in, in China. That process is continuing. But let's go to Inner Mongolia, and we look down from space at the world's largest coal-fired power plant. In fact, this is 6,720 megawatts. And you can see, if, if we look down the coal handling facilities, you can see the, the smokestacks, the boiler halls, the turbine halls. You can see the, the cooling towers for the first four units. And you can see, because China is like South Africa, is a dry country using uh, um, heat exchangers for uh, air cooling uh, for, for that power plant. China knows that it, is, it needs pump storage, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, like you to look at, this is a, a, a 2,000 megawatt pump storage station, part of 32,000 megawatts of pump storage built in China that you see the, uh, in, uh, in Zhejiang province recently completed uh, as, as, a, as a new facility because China knows that despite the fact that what you look down here at the world's largest redox battery, which uh, uses vanadium rather than lithium ions to, uh, to, to charge, this is an 800 megawatt hour redox uh, uh, flow battery that uh, is, uh, is now in operation in, in China. We leave China and go to Europe that Crispian referred to, setting the, the pace for the world in terms of, uh, of uh, the energy transition. And we'll look at just three aspects of what is happening in Europe. The, the three ones is the first one, the, the argument in Europe about the future of nuclear power generation. Then we'll look at the massive move into, into wind. And we will look at uh, CO2 storage and, and battery storage. But let's, let's first look at what, what you look down at Europe and you see each of the purple markers is uh, operating nuclear power plant in, in Europe. And Europe is saying, where do we go with that? On the one hand, what you see here is, is the, the, the latest of the French nuclear power plants. And you've heard President Macron just announced uh, 13 new uh, nuclear plants for the future. What you see there is the first of these pressurized water reactors that came into operation in 1986. And the second one uh, where the red dot is came in operation 1987. And they, they then decided in 2007 to build another one, which is the third one that you see there. That one is as yet not complete. And the struggles in Europe to complete nuclear power plants reliably on schedule and on cost is part of the, the difficult debate about nuclear uh, of the past and of nuclear of, of the future. Just across the border, Germany is phasing out its, um, its nuclear plants. And what you see here is the Gundremingen nuclear plant, which falls silent this year. You can see the first reactor and this, uh, the, 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 the last two reactors that, that you see from space below you. Those well-operating nuclear plants will be shut down and are being shut down and Germany will be without nuclear power by the end of this year as it now faces its challenges in terms of the political matters around Ukraine and, and North Stream. <clears throat> Looking down from space, you, you can see Europe's largest onshore uh, wind farm. This is in Romania on the Black Sea coast. Uh, this is what 600 megawatts looks like in terms of the uh, Fantanele Koliak wind farm in, in Romania. But public opposition to onshore wind farms has grown to such a degree in, in Europe that Europe now has to go offshore. And uh, we, we go to the, the Danish uh, waters uh, in, the, uh, in the southern North Sea. And what you see be behind you is a fully full offshore wind farm. Uh, at Horns Rev 1, but you can also see the requirement for a, a big converter station that is also needs to be at sea to bring that all that power generated at sea on onshore, quite a, 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 an additional challenge of, of the offshore wind industry. And lastly, we go to Iceland. We look down near Reykjavik, the, the capital of, uh, of, uh, of Iceland, and what you see on, on screen now is the Orca direct air capture uh, facility that extracts CO2 from the atmosphere 
and pumps it in underground in Iceland. And the, the, first, the first attempts to commercially do that still quite costly uh, at this time. We move to one of South Africa's BRICS fellow countries, India, uh, with its own challenges uh, in the way that Crispian described uh, the developing world's challenges of, of the energy transition. I'm going to, going to look at only two aspects of that. Uh, the, the first part is that it is importing clean LNG to, to clean up the air in its cities uh, and expanding the gas transmission world to do so, but also massively expanding solar in its deserts. And you can see in pink along the Indian West Coast from Mundra in the north to Kochi uh, in Kerala State in the, in the south on the West Coast and also on the East Coast, the growing number of big LNG import terminals in India. And we look down from space at the Mundra plant and you can see there where the LNG carriers birth and you can see the two LNG storage tanks on land there. That's what an LNG terminal looks like from space once completed. But we go to the deep desert in Rajasthan to look at the world's second largest uh, uh, solar farm, the Badla Solar Park, which has now reached a total of about 2,500 megawatts. You can see it being built in large chunks at a time, expanding, not competing for land with agricultural land. And just look down on that and see how that competes with the largest being built in China and also in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East. Or we go to the the, the, uh, the border with Kashmir, and I will come back to rooftop solar in a moment, but we look down on the Dera Baba Jaimal religious sect, and you can see here uh, on top of their community hall uh, and on top of their accommodation blocks what 11 megawatts of rooftop solar in India looks like as India tackles its, its transition. We go to uh, Indonesia, a, a country with a uh, 250 million people uh, spread over 13,000 islands. And that is a, uh, a challenge in terms of its energy transition. It is still generating, like South Africa, most of its coal energy from coal. And we look down on the turbine oils and the coal handling yard of its largest coal fired power station called Suralaya, and where the coal is brought in by barge. But that has enabled uh, Indonesia in terms of its challenge for, for, uh, for its energy transition to go from 67% of electrification in 2010 to 99, let's call it 100% electrification by 2019, uh, and not, not constrained by the availability of electricity. The biggest debate in Indo Indonesia is the fact that it is producing palm oil. It has stripped the island of Borneo, the Indonesian part, over the past decades of, uh, of forests to build palm oil for, for biofuels. And, and you can see a biofuel plant there and biofuel storage tanks from newly forested uh, palm oil plantations. We go briefly to a G20 country, third largest economy in the world, Japan. And we can see quite, quite clearly on screen that Japan is on the one hand struggling with nuclear pro program because and that has damaged public trust. On the other hand, relying on LNG uh, to, to deal with that, in, in reclaiming expensive land for solar and wondering how to reconfigure its steel industry, the same uh, dilemma that, uh, that Crispian spoke of earlier. Let's for a moment go down, go first to what you see below you from space, the reactors of the uh, eight reactors of the largest nuclear power plant, 8,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity at uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa on the Japanese west coast. But this plant is completely silent after two earthquakes, one in 2007 and one in 2011 that destroyed Fukushima. This plant now will never operate again. And you can imagine even in a big country like Japan, what it takes if 8,000 megawatts of capacity is ripped out of your power system. So you can see north to south over the three big islands of Japan, every one of those markers is a, uh, courtesy of Wiki Solar, is a, uh, uh, a photovoltaic solar plant being built in Japan. But let's go to Kagoshima. And here you see from space a 200 megawatt solar farm built on re la reclaimed land. Land is so short 
in 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 that country that they they have to to go to to the sea reclaim it and then build solar and looking down japan is one of the big proud steel producers of of the world along with china and the united states and you look down on on the fukuyama uh, uh steel works in you and japan is now saying how do we bring in enough green hydrogen to produce steel in future in in this country on the african continent we we go to the other major economy in africa uh, uh, nigeria uh, that is still uh, am exporting oil and and uh, and lng for its uh, uh, for revenue for its uh, budget ambitiously expanding petrochemicals at world scale consuming wood on a sc- on a scale that means that on a daily basis more energy in the country is consumed as wood than as oil and and gas together um and and struggling with the start of its renewables program we look down from space on mr dangote's uh large new refinery fertilizer and petrochemical pro- uh, complex just outside lagos that you can see on on your screen and you can see that the construction to to get this project done is still happening at an alarming rate uh, no at a at a fast pace breakneck speed rate because at the same time nigeria and wood markets still supply the country with just so much wood uh, on a on a daily basis that you you see there in the north of the country that is dry we look down from space at the bayero university there you can see the university buildings but look what it's done they've put a big solar farm right next to the university and along with some diesel backup and battery storage they can now power that university uh, g- given the the supply problems that nigeria has we go to the the superpower in world energy russia that relies as the coldest country in the world on gas fired power generation and heating is expanding lng and is opening still markets for for oil and gas exports and i first take you to in the russian central russia you can see uh, to the city of sogut and we look down on the world's largest gas fired power plant in fact about 6000 megawatts supplies power but also heat to the cities of uh, of surgut and if you wonder why is necessary to supply heat uh, supply heat let's look at that same photograph during the winter when the temperature outside is minus 40 and you can see a, a, a city covered by ice temperature is minus 40 this plant has to run to keep the place and the people alive to 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 be frank or right on the north coast near the north pole the latest novatech yamal lng export terminal that you see below us and there you can see what lng export trains look like and where the loading facilities sit and to enable that russia is now working very hard to uh, it is tradition had to take cargoes through the, the mediterranean of oil and uh, and gas mediterranean and then through the straits of malacca to get to asia it is now enabling the northern sea route and to to do that we we look down at a town called pevek uh, on the on on the arctic coast of russia and uh, you can see still drift ice in the port but there you can see a very special vessel which we see here this is the the the, the first modular reactor on a barge in the world pro- supplying both heat and electricity into the town on that northern sea route to to keep it alive from on the academic lomonosov um quite quite spectacular we go just for one thing to saudi arabia because what is not mentioned in the introduction and the end transition is the interaction with on the subject of uh, water where saudi arabia as the key player in opec is using gas for the desalination of uh, of uh, water seawater to 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 keep the country going as part of its future economy and the blue dots that you see around the saudi coast are all the are all the um, uh, uh, desalination plants that have been built on the west coast on the bottom and the east coast on the right and let's go to jubail and what you see here is probably the world's largest uh, desalination plant sort of uh, can can keep almost cape town going more half of cape town going from a plant that you see there's the the water intake there are the reverse osmosis 
uh, units that, uh, that take the salt out of the water. They are the gas turbines that drive the pumps to, to put the water through. And there's the return of the, of, of the, uh, the, the brine back into the ocean. Um, and that enables irrigation of the Saudi desert, or that and underground water. And we look down from space on, on these pivot, uh, pivot points and just if, if you'll be impressed by what you can do in a desert if you have water of either desalinated in terms of changing your economy from an oil economy to also being an agricultural economy. I speak to you from the UK today and here there's so much happening in terms of getting the energy system to work from uh, mostly wind, but at the same time, it is building the world's largest uh, uh, under construction uh, nuclear power plant and rapidly expanding on the demand side, electric vehicle charging. Let's just look at two images. This from space is the old, is the size will A and size will B, but here sits a 3,200 megawatt site of a 3,200 megawatt nuclear power plant under construction, already approved in 2016, and uh, will probably come online in about three years from now, when a com combination of European and Chinese interests will have completed th this work. At, on the demand side, <coughs> charge points are growing very, very rapidly in, uh, in, in the UK. And this is I'll contrast it with other countries in a moment. This is what 42,000 charge points look like scattered over the map of the UK when, uh, when you want to uh, electrify your, your, your vehicle fleet. Lastly, we go to the United States uh, now under the Biden administration and dealing with many, many challenges, but I'll highlight three from the many that you see on, uh, on screen. The first one is, it has now achieved energy independence from OPEC, from Russia, from the rest of the world. Um, and it says, so what do we do with that in a geopolitical sense in future? Highlighted by the events in Ukraine right now. It is surpassing Qatar and Australian energy exports and it's implementing CO2 utilization. And below you from space, you see the big so-called unconventional or uh, shale oil fields. And we go... Uh, bottom left to the Permian, which is on the border between Texas and, and New Mexico. And looking down from space, you see the fracking of, of the countryside. Uh, you can see each of the white dots, but I'll zoom in again. And this is what has now made America the largest oil producer in the world, where each of these well pads that you see from space are connected and connected and connected and connected to supply a total of 5,000 5 million barrels a day, larger than the largest Saudi oil field. And what is made under the Trump administration and the Biden administration, America self-reliant. That Those oil fields produce so much gas that the, the U.S. has just ramped up as a as an LNG export. And you see here the Calcasio Pass LNG to export terminal, which has now started production. You can see modules of production modules being shipped in by on, on a barge in front of you. And the last image, we look down on the world's largest uh, carbon set capture and, and storage facility at Shoot Creek uh, in Wyoming, uh, as, as the US begin to say, how do we remove CO2? On that basis, Chris, that's what's happening in the rest of the world uh, and answer that question very briefly as, uh, or Crispian's question as briefly as I could. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And uh, my takeaway from this is the incredible uh, diversity of solutions uh, that people have developed and the complexity of these solutions uh, in every different corner of the world, having uh, its own unique geography, geology, uh, natural resources, uh, you, know, you know, has developed their economies around these resources. And in a way, it's impressive, but uh, but also for me, it's uh, it's it leaves me sort of a little shaken uh, as to uh, the sheer complexity of the problem and the solutions. And every time uh, you know we face new challenges of one form or another, uh, another layer of complexity 
is laid on what we have already. And one has to ask the question, as has been asked by various academics that I was introduced to yesterday. You, you know, at some point, the returns, uh, the benefits uh, resulting from these extra layers of complexity um, uh, are not keeping up with the costs and the risks of this complexity. And one has to wonder what is going to happen to the world in the next 100 years. Uh, but it's not for me to answer these questions. It's me to listen. And I just want to thank Andy and thank Crispian for that question and Andy uh, for, for his response. Uh, before I introduce you uh, to uh, Priscilla Mabalani, uh, Priscilla, as I had told you before, is, is in charge of energy at, uh, at Sassel. Uh, and that's obviously uh, one of South Africa's biggest energy companies, if not the biggest energy company in South Africa. And um, I'd like to introduce you to Priscilla uh, to tell us, uh, give us her insights and to also ask a question uh, from Andy. Over to you, Priscilla. Thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks for, again, scheduling a thought-provoking session. And I'm really looking forward to learning today. And, and Andy, thanks for those key insights that you've shared with us. Um, I think, as Crispin has highlighted, the energy transition is a fundamental opportunity and yet challenge for South Africa as well. And as such, well, we're quite clear that for us to remain competitive and to build uh, and continue to build um, our business and to support Southern Africa uh, to grow its economy, we really need to play a critical role in the energy transition. As a result, uh, last year we've outlined an ambitious strategy with clear targets uh, where we've set an ambition that by 2050, we intend to be um, net zero from an energy, um, from a carbon emission intensity perspective. To enable that, we've also been clear that um, in line with some of the challenges that Andy um, has shared with us is that technology will continue to develop at a fast pace and the uncertainty associated with that technology development will require us to be flexible. So as such, we've actually defined pathways that gives flexibility to achieve that ambition. To, to that extent, we do see that as Sassel, given our biggest um, and complex uh, experience in running operations in South Africa and globally, but also the fact that we have leading technologies such as our Fisher Trops proprietary technology, and that South Africa is actually in down, is blessed with endowments related to renewables. We are actually at an advantage stage to then lead that energy transition for South Africa. So to enable that, we have set the ambitions to 2030, which um, good to say we are actually progressing well on. So we will reduce our both scope one, scope two um, by 10, uh, 30% to 2030. And that is actually underpinned by our announcement, which is progressing in really procuring the biggest renewable energy for our operations going forward with our partners early kit. Um, we have an ambition of 1,200 megawatts. We've already progressed with the first 600 megawatt and uh, we, we are finalizing that going forward. Secondly, we have also been explicitly clear that we see gas playing a critical role in the energy transition. And that then requires us to continuously look at expanding our plateau, uh, plateau and gas production in Mozambique. And we've made good progress. We continue to invest in some of the recent announcements that we've made in the extension of the near field, such as the PSA investments that we've made. We've been making good progress in terms of that investment. At the same time, we also indicated that for both ourselves, as well as our major uh, guest users, we would like to bring LNG uh, into the country at scale. And as such, we are actually looking and prioritize Matola as the first import um, terminal for us to be able to import LNG. So to that extent, I'm happy to say we're making good progress. We are in discussions in terms of a term sheet with partners and hoping that by 2026, we'll bring the first 40 to 60 petrojoules in country. We are continuing to engage with other stakeholders such as the uh, Central Energy Fund, Transnet, to ensure that we can also bring LNG through Riches Bank, uh, particularly for, uh, for inland and we can repurpose some of the pipelines and infrastructure that South Africa has. So that's really those ambitions for us to 2030. 
Beyond that, we do believe that green hydrogen, given the endowments I've mentioned, is going to play a critical role. So to that extent, you've seen, um, Chris, we've announced a number of projects that we are working on. We are already repurposing a small uh, facility for us in Sasselbeck to produce green hydrogen by 2023. At the same time, we are also looking at how do we then ensure that we are going to play in the hydrogen export market because it's very important for our repurposing our operations to low carbon that hydrogen is competitive at between a, a dollar to two dollars per kg. And to enable that, we are going to be ensuring that we are participating in the hydrogen and we are very keen to see that we are actually leading the Bukhaba, the first catalytic project, which is Bukhaba project for South Africa. And lastly, there are a number of applications in terms of green steel, commercial transportation, where we've already announced multiple projects to say we will lead the energy transition. And at the same time, at the global space, we've also announced that EcoFT, which is really a go-to-market um, opportunity that we see where we will unlock the value of our future trops technology to create value for Sasol and also to support the energy transition. And there we are prioritizing sustainable aviation fuel as the first, as the first application. So I'm going to pause there and it's been quite um, interesting listening um, to Andy. And I wanna pause the question to, um, pose a question to, uh, to him as well to understand what is his views in terms of the energy transition for South Africa. Yeah, thank you so much, Priscilla, for those insights and for that question uh, that you posed to Andy. He's talked a lot about what different countries are doing and have been doing and uh, are going to be doing, uh, you know, in this energy transition. Uh, and you've asked the question, how do you see the energy transition uh, uh, playing out in South Africa? So I'm going to hand over now to Andy to uh, deal with that question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Can I check? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, uh, to answer Priscilla's question, I have to say that the South African debate about the energy transition is particularly noisy <laughs> and loud. Uh, if I, even if I compare it to the other 14 countries that I referred to earlier, um, and because there is the call for net zero emissions by 2050, there's an equally loud call for reducing our unemployment, which stands at, depending on which statistic, about 40%. To end uh, load shedding, which now is in 2021 reached the level of 2.5 terawatt hour, uh, raise our, uh, grow our economy at the same time from the $5,000 per GDP per capita and get our, our economic growth rate up from zero to 1% to, to something quite real. The calls for a just transition, uh, the, the mantra, uh, which of we're not a victim, but and uh, we're a victim, but not the cause of climate change, and uh, improve our credit rating. Overwhelming, if one looks at the South African economy through its its so-called Sankey diagram, which shows uh, on the same scale the oil imports into the country, the the coal production in the country, the size of the gas industry, the size of the remaining wood consumption where the country is not electrified the size of the solar and wind industry, the size of the hydro industry in South Africa and the size of the nuclear industry, you can see how coal production and exports and coal power, firstly as production, secondly as exports, and thirdly as, as coal to power, how that dominates the South African energy economy more so than, than any else. Nobody on this call does not know that the country relies on coal-fired power generation uh, which, to be frank, is not unreliable. It is unreliable because it's been poorly maintained. And when we look at the big Eskom power plants, uh, old, young, or old and new, we, we can first go to Endrina, which is already built between 1970 and 1976, and see the coal stacks uh, and the, the 10 generating units from space, and we can see the, the cooling towers of a station that has now been running for roughly 50 years. Or we go to the, the latest uh, uh, two stations of Madupi. You can see the coal handling facilities the, from space, the, uh, the, the, uh, the six uh, um, boiler halls and uh, turbine units. 
uh, and we can see the, the, the heat exchanges. Um, or <clears throat> we, we travel to, to the Grote Geluk Colliery, the largest mining component in, still in South Africa, and we look down on the open pits and the coal handling facilities as it supplies Matimba and Madupi. Um, or <clears throat> we, we look down at, at the sister station of, of, of Madupi Kusile, the coal handling facilities and the, uh, and the boiler halls and turbine units and the heat exchangers. And <clears throat> so much of the South African electricity story can be told because the, the cost and schedule overruns of Madupi and Kusile, as well as their poor startup performance has increased the debt load of Eskom and South Africa, has led to the severe load shedding for the country and the rapid tariff increases that industrial and domestic and farming and business customers are experiencing. Um, and these two plants, in my view, have really challenged the ability of an Eskom generation to in future say, but we also want to build the next power plant, whether it is coal or gas or nuclear for that matter. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. The mainstay foundational element of the South African economy and of where Africa is so com competitive and perhaps one of the area, only areas where it can be competitive is extracting and beneficiating minerals. But that same industry is struggling with load shedding. It does not matter whether we go down to the, one of the biggest gold mines uh, in the world, three kilometers down, you, you can see, you can see the, the, the uh, South Deep Gold Mine. And imagine how much reliable electricity is needed for the, the cooling and the hoisting and the crushing that, that takes place here. Or we go to the, uh, the, the second or third important sector in the mining industry of the platinum group, metals of platinum, palladium, and rhodium, and ruthenium, and osmium, and more. And we go to the Mohalakwena mine, you can imagine the amount of energy required to, to do the haulage and the processing uh, from, from this mine. This is also where Anglo-American is, is taking, is advancing plans to convert it, its fleet of giant diesel fueled mine trucks to hydrogen as part of the hydrogen valley that I'll come back to in a moment. Or important over decades now in South Africa, it's iron ore industry to feed those Japanese steel mills that we looked at earlier. And below us, we see the, uh, the session mining complex of several large iron ore mines. You can see the, the iron ore mines uh, where the red dots go and the, the big long railway line that, that carries it from session all the way down to Saldana. And let's visit Saldana for a moment. And below us in Saldana, you can see the the, uh, the, the, the storage area and the loading area uh, where ships leave for, for Japan and, and Asia in, in, with, with iron ore. Or we look down at the CP Boa and the Mahatman manganese mines uh, below us, uh, one of the other major sectors, all requiring reliable, affordable, competitive energy to, to compete with other countries like Australia, like Brazil, like Chile in, 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 in world energy. And then there's the beneficiation sector with, uh, we look down in my, uh, across our border into, my, into uh, uh, Mozambique at the, at the Mosul smelter now run by South 32. Um, and it is smelters like these or beneficiation plants like these in South Africa and in Africa that need competitively priced reliable electricity uh, but also need clean electricity, as Crispian explained at the beginning, that with, with low uh, scope one and scope two emissions uh, as it is transferred. Proudly now, Sasol uh, and the Secunda plants have been using both coal uh, uh, and producing fuel and chemicals from coal and increasingly gas, as uh, Priscilla explained a moment ago. And we looked down from space at, uh, at Secunda at the coal handling facilities and the processing facilities to produce 160,000 barrels of, of uh, refined products for the South African market uh, from, from the Secunda facilities. <clears throat> At the same time, South Africa is importing a lot of oil and refined products, but uh, in my view, somewhat sadly, but as a reality, running down its petroleum refineries, that means we will need to import more product rather than import oil but not yet preparing uh, for the electrification of transport of the country. We, we look down at the SAPREF, one of the four refineries in the country, SAPREF uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, 
uh, at uh, the largest uh, refinery, uh, but recently announced by Shell and BP that they will now uh, uh, st stop the refining process here and, and, and take a, a look at uh, the future of this refinery. Right, right next to it sits um, the engine ref re refinery, which is likely to become an, a, 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 an import terminal uh, that, that we see down here. And I have to say, even if one looks down at it from space, you can see that these are, are tired facilities that need capital in uh, a decision needs to be taken about its future. If I were to compare what other facilities in Africa or the rest of the world looks like. And below us, we see the significant fast charge points in South Africa for as South Africa prepares for electric vehicle charging, but still so slow in its development and some clear policy decisions need to be taken uh, about one, the, this, the, uh, the, the nature of the electricity that, that feeds this, uh, and two, the timing, and three, the, the, the scope of, of the network. A, for the DMRE and for South Africa and for ESCOM, uh, a fantastic success story is the expansion of the IPP so for solar and wind in the country. And if we look at the South African wind atlas where the strong red areas around the coast show 10 meters per second wind where you can build good wind, then you can see where the South African wind farms are either in operation or in construction in each of those blue dots. And the number inside is the number of, of wind farms either being planned or under construction or in operation. And in the Southern Cape, along that coast where the wind is so rich, we look down from space at one of those wind farms, the Mulilo de Aad Manaberg uh, station. You can see the white dots of, of, of that uh, 94 megawatt wind farm. Or we go to Jeffreys Bay and uh, in, just off the coast, and benefiting from the fantastic winds along the coast. You can see in the, in the white area, the, the big 138 megawatt Jeffreys Bay wind farm. Likewise, in solar, other than Australia, I cannot, uh, and Chile, I cannot really name countries that are as blessed with solar power as South Africa. And you can see that at, uh, at the, in the deep red, the, the, the areas, and that's where the South African solar farms are being built with all the associated transmission challenges for Eskom. And you can see a, 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 a dark blue dot is a photovoltaic plant, and a red dot is a concentrated solar farm. And we look down uh, at the, the Jasper plant and the, um, and the Lissedi plant uh, in, the, in the Northern Cape. And that's part of the, the success story of what South Africa has achieved during, with the renewables bid rounds. Or they are becoming kind of a solar capital of South Africa. And you can see one after the other solar farm being, uh, being constructed in, in, in the Daar area. Not all of them are photovoltaic. Katu is a concentrated solar, and you can see the parabolic trough technology, the north-south lines that, that heat sodium, uh, and the sodium storage tanks in, in, in the middle, uh, not only at Katu, but we see a different configuration at the Khi solar farm, also in the Northern Cape, um, which has already been in, in operation for about six years. And you can see the solar reflectors onto the solar tower in the middle and, and the water storage ponds for, for cleaning. South Africa has, has had to make a call on, on, on Kuburg. Kuburg has served the country well uh, over the, uh, since it was commissioned in 1984-85. Uh, and below us, we can see the two reactors there. We can see the, the turbine hall, steam turbine halls, and we can see the cooling water inlet and, and, and outlet. And uh, great to see Eskom uh, thinking about life extension, replacing the, the steam generators first and when the license uh, expires in uh, 2024, I'll come back to, it is important that assets be run to the end of their life in a developing country. There's not the luxury of early, of early decommissioning. And <clears throat> In my view, if we look down at the Jeffreys Bay area from space at Taste Pint, where the, um, uh, which is the site for the next nuclear st station proposed, the, the question, Chris, is not whether South Africa should build more nuclear. The question is 
What is going to be the cent per kilowatt hour price? Who will own it? Who will take the risk of building that? It can't be the government. It can't be Eskom, and that simply transfers it to customers when that goes wrong. And until there is that commercial clarity, and the DMRE has now launched a, a bid round for, for a commercial advisor for that, and there, it is premature to say whether it's a good idea or bad idea. The fundamental question is, what is it going to cost? Who's going to own and operate it? Uh, and who's going to take the, the, the risk and cost and schedule following the Madupe and Kusili incidents uh, in terms of a license to operate nuclear in, in, in South Africa? Mozambique has been, uh, is in the, is in, remains in world news when it comes to energy and has been a, a reliable uh, power supplier from Korabasa. We see the Zambezi River, the Korabasa Dam, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we see the, the, uh, the power plant uh, below us from space. And those, that import, import now for nearly 50 years has served South Africa and Mozambique well and in terms of, of trading. And also, as Priscilla spoke of earlier, the, the cross-border gas supply arrangement between Mozambique and South Africa, first for Panditimani and other gas along the, the, the pipelines, and, and now possibly Matola, uh, will serve the two countries and its relationship well, as I've seen in so many other parts of, of the world. Um, <clears throat> so in response to trying to limit load shedding, the DMRE has now said, uh, let's, let's uh, go proceed with emergency facilities in the port of Saldana, in Kucha, uh, and in Richards Bay, and bring a, a, uh, a car power ship into each of, each of those facilities. Yes, it confronts South Africa with many dilemmas, as I will come back to in a moment. But uh, the first one is, what are we going to do about load shedding? It cannot continue for another decade. And if we do not come, come up with solutions, then, uh, th then, then the lack of confidence is going to be severe. Yes, there is a matter of outflow of foreign exchange, which is, is, is complicated. Yes, it's a matter of energy purchase in dollar terms, but those problems can, as be, have been overcome by more countries than I could name today. That's simply a reality of, of international energy systems. Countries trading limited power than Southern, Southern African power pool, but uh, needs to urgently think, what does it do with 3,500 megawatts of supply from Inga? If we look at Africa and its power pools in the south and the west, in the Maghreb area, in the east, in the central area, in the overlapping areas called multiple, there's been limited power traded because um, there are generally de deficits in investment in generating and transmitting power in most of the countries, lack of trust between member states and a low willingness to liberalize their markets that is required for the trading and the dominance of state and national power producers. Um, the 2019 IRP allows for 2,500 megawatts of imports of hydroelectricity all the way from Grand Inga uh, in the DRC. And if we look down at this fantastic river, and you can see in blue the, uh, the catchment area of, of the river in all of the, the, the uh, equatorial Africa, then the plan to build something very large at Inga has now been going for 30 years, and you can see on the left the schematic of one of the development proposals on the right, the river uh, over, overlaid. Uh, in, in, my view, in my view, South Africa needs to urgently think about what it's going to do when this does not materialize by 2030 as per, per the IRP. Um, the, the necessary conditions and I've, are not in place to bring that power to South Africa in that timescale. Coal exports from Richards Bay are declining, and we look down at Richards Bay and the coal handling facilities from a 90 million ton facility, which, which now as a result of market changes in the world has probably declined last year, which is a strange year in world history, uh, to about 55 million tons. Um, and South Africa needs to say, where, where do we go with that in future? 
it is right for the various ministries to cooperate with the private sector to plan hydrogen production, but South Africa must think world scale. Uh, to the combination of the hydrogen valley built around Anglo-American and the Molochakwena and Limpopo area for hydrogen usage in that area, in the Johannesburg area and in the Durban and Richards Bay area is a good start. The country should continue on, but the country should also know that to play uh, in hydrogen and play, it will be competing with Namibia and with uh, Morocco and with Chile and with Australia for international markets uh, with, uh, w- and means to think at scale. And if you want to think what at scale means, this is what at scale means. This is an Australian project. You can see uh, in, the, in the southwest of, of the, the country, 15,000 square kilometers in size, uh, 50 gigawatts of upstream wind and solar. You can see in, in combination in the central area here. That's what at world scale in Chile or, or means. And then I get to what Crispian in, uh, into, uh, introduced at the beginning, which is South Africa's uh, history of and current situation in terms of 500 g- uh, million tons of, of CO2 into the atmosphere in future. And the question is, where will the government's and private sector's policies and action take South Africa uh, in, 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 in future? Chris, that in answer to Priscilla's question, how do I see some of the challenges and dilemmas and the trade-offs and the realities uh, as viewed through the energy system of South Africa? Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Andy. And I, I guess I have more questions than answers. Um, uh, you know, about how are we going to uh, play out this energy transition in South Africa based on the current realities? Uh, so it, it again leaves me, you know, a little bit awestruck at what's happening around the world, and I suppose what we're doing, but very conscious and um, anxious about the future. Uh, for South Africa in this environment. But now let me introduce you uh, to Rentia van Tonder, who is the head of power, corporate and investment banking at Standard Bank. And um, I think uh, Rentia, you've come at an important time in this (laughs) webinar. Uh, And I want to hand over to you uh, to give your insights and to pose your question uh, to Andy. Over to you, Rentia. Thanks, Chris, and uh, good morning, all. Um, Very interesting topic. Uh, We are grateful for the opportunity to be part of this webinar, uh, and certainly a meaningful engagement on such a a topical topic. So it's not only meaningful and important, but absolutely crucial for South Africa and the broader debate. So just briefly, Standard Bank as a leading bank on the continent, um, who most of you probably already know, um, we believe that the energy transition is not only about the transitioning of the energy sector towards clean and sustainable sources, but it cuts across every sector of the economy in line with the broader decarbonization strategy and climate commitments. And I think that's important to note. The importance of the energy transition, especially in the context of South Africa, to minimize the social economic impact and to support economic development will be an important driver towards long-term sustainable growth and planning going forward. Um, And to that end, the PCC play a critical role in supporting this trajectory. We've been proactive in driving discussions, whether that's with our clients, stakeholders, policy enablers, and future customers towards um, innovative thinking sustainable finance product development, which is absolutely key of mind at the moment, uh, as well as our clients' decarbonization strategies and how do we support them in this uh, journey. Um, I think it's important to note that as Standard Bank, we believe in in a holistic approach towards meaningful implementation. The question was asked about pace. When should this happen? I think it's, it's important for us to support the energy transition, not only through thought leadership, funding and client support across the power sector, but also to include the broader ecosystem it's linked to. And I think that's uh, absolute key 
driver to unlock localization um, and job creation within this energy transition. Uh, we have a broad renewables portfolio across utility scale projects, as well as uh, decentralized energy or captive opportunities, uh, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. Um, we are extremely committed to expand our funding going forward. And you will probably hear a bit more about Standard Bank and its commitments over the course of ma uh, March, when we will uh, have our results presentation. But I think all in all, the energy transition is an extremely exciting time for us as a commercial bank. Um, we believe that it's important to collaborate as partners, whether that's uh, different funders, technology providers like SASL, policy enablers, and the key, key growth and objective at the end of the day is for us to, to be able to make that difference and drive South Africa on this path of energy transition. Um, I've said quite a bit about uh, Standard Bank and our commitment and how we want to drive the debate and be involved with our clients, which I think we've got a unique opportunity to do. But I want to I want to pose the question to Andy. I mean, if you, you've spoken a bit about South Africa and what you see in the trends, but can you give us a sense of specific opportunities? I think that's certainly something that many of us are excited to hear. Thanks, Andy. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rentia, for those insights. And yeah, this gets to the interesting part also of, about the opportunities. Um, you know, what is it we have to do and what business opportunities there are? Uh, and thanks for that question, Rentia. Over to you, Andy. Lucas, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Chris, um, uh, I'm going to mention seven things which I think are really important for the country. Uh, and, and the first one is strange, but I think it is at the core, and which is, I make the statement today in front of this audience that ending load shedding is, is more important than achieving net zero emissions. Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me try and say why. What, what we see is the, over the past decade, the, the load shedding that has slowly grown in the country and which has so seriously undermined confidence in the country. Uh, we've recently had weeks where there was between 10 and 20,000 megawatts of capacity offline and South African industry, businesses, schools, hospitals and homes deserve better than that. Because we need to decide where is that curve going in future? Um, it could go that way if South Africa does not handle the transition well, or if we manage it well, it could decrease it with, with some, some profile. What is very clear, as Crispian spoke earlier, is that there is an ambition on the right-hand side, you can see the, the curve starts at 500 million tons of CO2 per year to get that down to zero or net zero by 2050. And the answer, Chris, as South Africa and we confront ourselves is not as simple as saying, well, let's just do, quickly do all renewables and the left will, will fix itself. If we do not get the pace and the cost and the affordability right, it will go wrong and the left-hand side will go up as, as we manage both the, the loss of the, uh, the, the load shed down from two and a half terawatt hours per year to zero and manage our CO2 transitions down. The second one, I'm going to talk to people. You know, what this part of what Rencha said about what Priscilla said is South Africa needs engineers, scientists, and technologists training at South African institutions. If I look across the world at other countries and on a comparative scale by the World Economic Forum and the World Bank, look at the number of available engineers and scientists, South Africa ranks lowest. And for a developing country, that is a major challenge in terms of us bringing, bringing the country forward in the energy transition, in its economic transition as a BRICS country. And we need to get that number for South Africa up. Thirdly, it is, there are many assets in South Africa which are quite old, but it depends in a country whether you think an energy asset which is 10 years old, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, 
um, is at the end of its so-called economic life and whether we look for a reason. I take you to the island of Borneo and you look down on a, a, a facility which has supplied reliably LNG to Japan for 50 years since 1969. And you can just look down and see the order, see the quality, see the care that has been taken by operating teams for 50 years. And that is what is required for every asset in the country, whether it is solar or wind or oil or coal or gas or whatever is, uh, is so, so important for, for the country in terms of, of uh, uh, maximizing the use of capital. The, the next part is that in the energy transition, uh, as Minister Matashe explained so eloquently, we, ha we have to keep the lights on. And the most valuable asset that South Africa has is the four pump storage stations uh, at Ingula and Drakensberg and Palmit and Siemens. And we look down from space on the, on the two reservoirs of, of Ingula. But the... the um, 3,000 megawatts of, sto of storage capacity and this about 70 gigawatt hours of, of storage there in combination is more storage to deal, one, with changes in demand, two, with uh, unreliable, poorly maintained uh, uh, coal-fired power plants and the intermittency of specifically wind, solar is less intermittent or unpredictable. But And this these four pump storage stations are the worth their weight in gold to the country to keep the lights on must be protected. Yes, <clears throat> uh, South Africa should rapidly uh, su support the rapid development of South African and Mozambican gas. Whether it is total in in energy, energy, total energies, Brilpada and Leipa discoveries, um, to, to follow what uh, what Total Energy was, will do in the offshore gas discoveries in Mozambique on the, on the border with uh, Tan Tanzania and eventually build an LNG facility like this. They have the capacity to do that and with, their, with partners also bring LNG in through Matola that we see from space down in, 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 in Mozambique. Really, really important that South Africa has access to its own resources and make the right choices. Lastly, uh, oh, six one is to set self-generation of electricity truly free and to maximize the installation of rooftop solar and to just demonstrate, Chris um, and Rensha, what, what can be done. I, for a moment, take you to Western Australia and we look down on a gold mine. This is the so-called Granny Smith gold mine. You can see bottom left map where that is in Australia. And if we look down more closely from space, you can see the combination of battery storage and gas gas generators that uh, that, that uh, support that mine. But more importantly, here you can see the 23,000 solar panels that support that mine uh, because it has been just liberated to do what it can do and do it quickly uh, for, for its portion of self-generation during at least during the day. Or we look down uh, on uh, in, in New South Wales near Sydney, at the kind of rapid rise of rooftop solar that you, that you see here, uh, 27,000 panels on, on, on rooftops. Or I take you to, to a country with the same sort of sunshine as South Africa, Jordan in the Middle East, and just look down on the, on the, on the uh, industrial area of Amman, the capital city, and in green, how rapidly solar panels on rooftops have spread, uh, supplying all the needs of, of those facilities to the... And my last, last opportunity is South Africa must enable the European financial support for the South African energy transition. Both COP and Europe need a success story from South Africa in the BRICS countries, in the emerging markets, in the developing world. Uh, those seven opportunities, Chris, and I'll gladly take any questions. Yeah, thanks uh, very much there, Andy. Uh, uh, you, you've indicated, I think, these key issues that we just have to deal with. Um, some of them may be unpalatable to some, uh, but you've, you've stated your case, you've given your view, uh, and we thank you very much for that. I do think that in South Africa, the uh, idea that there is going to be, and in fact is an energy transition in progress, 
uh, uh, has been accepted. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's accepted at, a, at the highest political level. It's accepted by the DMRE and its minister, and it's accepted by industry, by SASO, uh, uh, and by the people of South Africa. What I don't think is accepted yet, and there's still a lot of debate, is the pace of this energy transition. And we know it's got to happen, but the question is, on the one extreme, you have people who say, yes, it's got to happen, but it must happen as slow as possible uh, because of jobs and uh, uh, using our natural resources and uh, that it's going to take a long time uh, to do this transition and that we must be cognizant of those realities. And then on the other extreme, you have people who believe, say, yes, we know it's got to happen, but it's got to happen as fast as possible. Uh, uh, you know, we, we mustn't delay it in any way. Uh, it, they do acknowledge that it can't be done overnight, but it must be done as fast as possible. And I, I don't know, but somewhere in, in the middle, I guess, is the way this journey is going to play out for South Africa. Uh, it's still hotly contested um, uh, by the extremes, uh, but I think sometimes we should, um, we, we, we need to realize that the, the, the reality is going to be somewhere in the middle, no matter what one may think morally or ethically uh, about these issues. Um, I personally am filled with foreboding at, at climate change, uh, knowing how long it's going to take uh, to make a, a noticeable difference and that the things we do today will only be noticed in 20, 30 years time. Um, that unfortunately plays into the hands of the skeptics and those that want to do business as, as usual. And so I'm kind of filled with foreboding. But anyway, enough of my own views. <laughs> uh, I think it's now time for question and answers. And you know, we had set ourselves 20 minutes for this and it's about 14 minutes left. And I just look on the list of questions here, there's a total of 59 questions. So there's gonna be absolutely no chance that we can get through all these questions, but we are recording them and we will download them and we will try and address them. Um, but uh, I want to try and answer. I did receive four or three or four questions in writing uh, so uh, in advance. So I'd like to deal with those questions first. And the first one is um, from uh, Stephanie Barbeau. And Stephanie, I hope I've got the pronunciation of your name right. But Stephanie says, there's a desire to move to unbundle Eskom and create a competitive market. A key aspect will be needed uh, that will be needed is gas-fired plants to uh, to complement uh, variable renewable energy and IPPs. Flexibility will be crucial in a competitive market. How, however, is it realistic to think that gas-fired plants could be financed without 20-year power purchase agreements, and/or even only capacity payments? With the current gas prices not sustainable to buy only on LNG spot market. Is this realistic for, for, for our transition? Chris, the, so I have to give a short answer to a, a, a long question. Um, it, is, it is realistic. Um, it, it is realistic to do so. Uh, depends on what the choices are that South Africa has. Either Either uh, Andre de Reuter and Jan Oberholster and the and team need to get the availability of the coal-fired fleet up from 55 to 75% as per the IRP. Is that realistic uh, is the one option? Or South Africa continues to load shed to the depth that we've seen in 2021 and possibly growing. Or at some stage, the, the, the diesel fired open cycle gas turbines get tired, or we do this. So there are no easy choices. So, so the questioner should say, what are my options? Um, but the answer is, I don't have any is not an option. They are all difficult. This is realistic. And I say this because I've seen so many countries do it successfully. Okay. And Thank yes, I'm, 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 a, I'm aware of what that cost on, a, on a, a, a South African rands per kilowatt hour basis compared to the average Eskom prices, but I believe that is better than continuing load shedding and not having confidence in the country in terms of the, 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 the members of the, the minerals chamber not having the confidence to expand and deepen 
the, the, the mining sector in the country, as an example, or the industrial sector, or the hospitals in the country. Yeah, thanks, Andy. For that, uh, we're going to have to move on quite quickly. Uh, if, if I could uh, ask that we keep the answers as short as possible. I know they are complicated. <laughs> uh, but OK, a question here from Atanda Raji. Uh, he asks, and you know, Hydrogen has uh, taken kind of a, a center position on the stage. Government is talked about by the president uh, and, and, and uh, there are plans afoot as, uh, as Priscilla ha has, has detailed uh, that Cecil are, are looking at. But the question really is, what do you see the anticipated role for hydrogen energy in South Africa's energy transition journey? How do we leverage our platinum uh, group metals uh, and our endowment in this area for local beneficiation? And uh, really, I mean, I would like to just add to that is, uh, um, you know, we are a little bit behind, I think, uh, in Chile and, uh, and Australia, uh, and maybe some would say behind even uh, Namibia. But uh, if bearing all our challenges, can we become a global player on the export of green hydrogen as well as develop our uh, internal uh, market for green hydrogen to make a meaningful difference in our energy transition and into balance of payment through exports? Uh, uh, I can't add much to what I've said earlier. I think to start with the hydrogen valley, to think through think through Anglo-American uh, and Molokwane and the Popo province, think through uh, Johannesburg, think through uh, uh, Riches Bay is the right start. It's quite small. Um, <clears throat> hydrogen is not the answer for the future of, of, of road transport. Uh, it is maybe part of a, a small sector in that the large truck transport, but um, it is clear to me that the world is moving to electric transport. So South Africa is going to have to say how either through our internal demand are we going to get costs down to $2 per ton, uh, per kilogram, or how are we going to, by playing at the international scale on a, at an Australia level or Chile level, how are we going to compete internationally, uh, just in short. Thanks for that. Uh, a question here in writing from Rodney McAllister. Uh, says that the saga of Shell's sizing survey, a most routine operation, highlights the increasing polarity of energy debate in South Africa. Most press and commentators seem to side with the protesters. But if they have their say, South Africa will remain dependent on hydrocarbon imports and intermittent re renewable power. Should the government mount a public education campaign for energy literacy or is that a lost cause? <laughs> a bit of a loaded question, uh, not one that I necessarily agree with, but uh, that's the question to you, Andy. Uh, so the, the, the project for South Africa is to develop the Brilpada and Leipzig uh, reserves. Those are so far advanced in the queue of, of, uh, of, of development sequencing that uh, I'd like to leave it to that. If we can't do that, then it doesn't matter where the shell explores and finds more gas on the South African East Coast or West Coast or in Namibia, South Africa needs to de demonstrate that post the closure of mass gas, th those finds and discoveries can be commercialized. Thank you. Uh, a, a question uh, uh, that comes actually from, um, uh, from Etienne Rubbers here. He says here, at this stage, should South Africa spend any time to consider nuclear? Given one, our poor track record, with respect to uh, construction times, two, uh, radioactive wastes, three, South Africa skills levels, and, and, uh, and, and, and is South Africa up to such a development? Uh, I know you've, I, I think you've covered this pretty well in, in your presentation about, uh, you know, what, are the, what is the real question? Uh, and you, I think you pointed to economics, uh, you pointed to flexibility, uh, and and uh, I may just want to add a point that, you know, if we're going to add 30 gigawatts of variable renewable energy uh, by 2030, as is the plan, uh, is 2,500 megawatts of steady power uh, at the bottom of all of this by 2035? Is this any solution for South Africa? Because if you have 30 gigawatts of variable renewable energy, uh, you know, two and a half uh, gigawatts of of steady power from nuclear uh, it seems to me to make absolutely no difference whatsoever and doesn't solve the problem of variable renewable energy. But your comments further on, on nuclear. 
Chris, I think for South Africa for the next two decades, the combination of ESCOM generation getting the availability up through a well-managed, well-orchestrated effort in combination with energy imports in the short term for, through the car, car power ship, uh, plus as rapid as possible e expansion and integration amidst the transmission constraints uh, and the unbundling of ESCOM. I, I would put those four things ahead of also tackling a nuclear program and the management and board and financial distraction that that will be for uh, of a nuclear program for the country. And that's a deeply considered answer. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, uh, a question that Clive, Clyde Mellinson has uh, often raised uh, that I'd like to raise uh, here for you to consider. Now, nobody is suggesting, at least of all Clyde, uh, you know, that tomorrow we switch off all our coal-fired power plants or Kuberg or anything like that. Uh, you know, we're not talking about that. But when it comes to new generation capacity for South Africa, Clyde is proposing a massive overbuild of wind and solar PV uh, supported by a variable, uh, sorry, flexible generation capacity in the form of battery energy storage in combination with our existing quite significant and valuable resources of pumped water storage as the solution going forward for South Africa. And of course, that means it's not talking about switching off coal tomorrow. So uh, he, he just says that the solution is overbuilding of solar PV and wind plus battery storage plus our existing pump storage scheme. Is that a solution for South Africa going forward? Forget about gas. That doesn't come into his, his, his calculation. <clears throat> I, I did not spend a lot of time on batteries today, and, uh, but I, I can say to this audience that I have visited in every significant 100, 200, 300, up to 800 megawatt hours of, of battery storage facility in the world. Now, Eskom's pump storage stations, where I agree with Clyde, are at roughly, or South Africa's four pump storage stations, store roughly 70 gigawatt hours of electricity. That is much more than the total installed utility scale battery storage systems in the world. That's the size. Of, so that's why I said this is the gold for that South Africa has to protect first part. What overbuild is, is always gets me slightly worried. South Africa does not have the capacity to, financial capacity to overbuild anything. Anything that is overbuilt uh, uh, needs to be paid for by somebody. And that somebody is, is, is either customers as a total, in a total, uh, in totality or customers who, who in, a, in a market system pay for it. In the market systems, things are not overbuilt. But I think it, what he means is rapidly, he probably means rapidly escalate. Um, yes, I think South Africa should rapidly escalate, but the answer is not going to be in battery storage uh, for a decade or two. Uh, you, you need an, a, a gas-fired solution a la car power ship. Uh, and I'm not particularly an advocate for, for car power ship or for gas-fired solutions, but South Africa cannot allow load shedding continue. That's why I had the audacity, Chris, to say that needs to be the rallying call for the, the, the South Africa energy systems recovery. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Andy. Just a, a comment again on, on Andy's thing. Uh, he was talking about this overbuild in terms of having surplus capacity uh, to be used for the uh, charging of battery storage as well as for electric vehicles, uh, charging, uh, and uh, the, the surplus is not just come, you know, it's, it's not just a cost, uh, but it brings a massive benefit to the future of South Africa. I just wanted to mention that, but let's move on to the next question. And it's going to have to be our last question, unfortunately. And this is from Andres Matuetwa. Uh, Andres says as follows, as part of the energy transition solution, to what extent is the carbon capture and storage technology being considered globally 
I'm raising this in view of the fact that South Africa has extensive coal reserves and a huge installed base of coal-fired power stations. So I think he sees this as a possible solution. Uh, is this something that we should be looking at or is this a distraction? Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll say this much. Um, so again, looking where, so, so carbon sequestration is happening in Europe, in Canada, in the US, in Australia. Those are the uh, of, of, of some significance at the sort of multi million ton level per year. Costs of, of that is also coming down uh, in the same way that battery storage is coming down. Uh, uh, so, that and of direct air capture has come down a lot. But the big point is this it, it does not happen in a country until there is a significant carbon tax. And so, can our significant carbon tax. Has, has significant implications. It is paid for by customers in, across the country. So uh, until a carbon tax is implemented at roughly $100 per ton, uh, whether it is pounds per ton or euro per ton or dollars per ton, doesn't matter. Until that level in South Africa is so far behind that carbon sequestration is not part of the solution. And that's a tough call that the Minister of Finance and the presidency and the climate commission and the DMRE need to make together. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and and I, I agree, you know, the economics is obviously the key issue. Uh, but I think it goes even further than in South Africa. It's about the geography and the geology, uh, which, uh, you, you know, make it perhaps even more expensive than, than, than in other countries of the world where, the, where it is being done at the moment. But again, uh, we, we're running out of time and uh, it's really uh, now to draw a close, a close uh, to this uh, uh, webinar, it's 11.30 at the moment, we haven't even touched on most of the questions and I'd like to make a proposal to our audience, although we're going to officially uh, close this webinar uh, now, uh, we're going to keep it open um, and we're going to try, uh, I mean I hate closing uh, you know, an event or a webinar when there's still lots of questions out there, plenty. Uh, and uh, Andy has agreed kindly to stay on uh, to field some of these uh, further questions. And I, I would like to say that after I close this, that we continue uh, to field questions, but let's do it verbally. In other words, uh, please, those people who want to ask a question, those that have asked a question but would really like an answer, to put up your hand. Uh, and I will see that your hand is up and we'll come to it and we'll deal with these things verbally rather than um, uh, rather than in writing on, on the chat program, which is quite distracting uh, for me and difficult. So in closing this webinar, I, I just would like to uh, firstly thank Andy for his time and effort that he's put into this presentation. Uh, he's done a lot of thinking about this. Uh, he's experienced on the global stage uh, and he's also experienced in South Africa. And I think what goes on in South Africa is close to his heart. Uh, and in fact, I may just mention uh, in passing, that uh, that Andy is due to visit South Africa shortly uh, from London, and uh, and and uh, he he will be receiving an honorary doctorate in engineering uh, from the University of Stellenbosch in recognition of, of his work. And Stellenbosch is his alma mater, where he did his first engineering degree uh, all those years ago. So I just want to congratulate you, Andy, on, on that uh, recognition of, of the work you've done, the lifetime of work uh, in the energy sector, both in South Africa as well as, uh, uh, as well as internationally. And it's been an honor to have you here as our presenter. And thanks also uh, to uh, uh, Crispin Olver, uh, Crispian Olver, uh, Rendia Fantonda and Priscilla Mabalani uh, for their input, for their questions, their provoking, thought-provoking questions that Andy has tried to answer and build his presentation around. So thank you uh, indeed. Thanks also to our uh, two sponsors today, that is Cecil and Standard Bank, uh, for their support. It's really greatly appreciated. Uh, and, um, and also thanks to you, the audience, uh, for being present. Uh, it's been a great audience. I hope it's been interesting and useful and thought provoking. Certainly for me, it has been very thought provoking uh, indeed, not always at a very excited and good level, but uh, sometimes at a uh, at an anxiety filled level. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, thank you for attending. So now we're going to carry on having officially closed this webinar. And I see a number of hands up. 
so I'm going to sort of uh, go to them one by one. And um, I, I see a question here uh, from uh, Wolfram Rainers. Uh, Wolfram, Dr. Wolfram Rainers, I'm going to allow you to talk now. And so you uh, switch on your microphone, please, and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much, Chris and uh, Andy. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. Um, uh, we are wondering, you know, uh, the, when you look at producing green hydrogen or green e-fuels, I mean, what you want to have ideally is a renewable energy source that is constant and reliable. So ideally 24 times seven, uh, which you normally only get from hydropower. And we know these resources are limited, but not from wind power or wind turbines. Uh, where you get it, however, uh, is on the open ocean in permanent wind zones, in the trade wind zones. Has this ever been considered? Uh, yes. Uh, you were, uh, so the, the next phase of European wind will go offshore, will go floating in deep water, uh, deep water more than 100 meters to 1.2 kilometers, where you can only float the wind turbine. But to have a wind turbine on a, on a tower which does this in waves as the wind picks up with that massive 200 meter diameter spinning wheel around it requires uh, some further technological development uh, with uh, either a three-blader three or two-blader solution. Uh, but yes, it is being seriously considered and then to also put the hydrogen facilities offshore. Uh, uh, so yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Wolfram, if you could put your hand down and switch your microphone off. Uh, and we'll go to the next uh, one that I saw with the hand up, which was Etienne Rubbers. Now, Etienne, you have asked an earlier question, but I'm going to allow you to talk now, if you can switch on your microphone. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks for the, the webinar. Um, Andy, my, my, the question is, should we not ex We've got a limit at the moment on the acceleration of renewable energy in the IRP. Should that constraint not be removed? Yeah, can you answer that, Andy? I just to to recap, I'm not sure to what extent you're aware, but there's uh, the IRP I'm, I'm okay. limit. Yeah, yeah I, I'm okay. Uh, Etienne, you're asking, you're asking a question which is whether these smallish tranches that such as the last round five announced by Minister Montage uh, should happen more faster. Um, yes, they, they, they can happen. I think the, the, the program is working. The transparency is admirable. The, the price uh, achieved in round five, I think is quite competitive at roughly two US cents per kilowatt hour for solar and wind. Uh, in that order of magnitude, which which uh, stand, but yes, with the associated av availability and intermittency. Uh, the, qu the question is, uh, is South Africa forever going to have a centrally planned electricity economy or are we heading for a market? But because to, to simply say, well, the minister will, will, uh, will sign more on behalf of ESCOM, the DMRE will sign and assign more PPAs to, to Eskom with a 500 million, 500 billion dollar uh, debt load uh, brings into this, this, the, the matter of the sovereign guarantee, et cetera, et cetera, in, into play and Eskom's ability to, to, to support just more and more of that amidst the transmission constraints which Eskom has explained so well. So no, to, to simply say the government will procure more and more uh, needs to be thought through in terms of those those considerations, Etienne, that I've just listed. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Etienne, if you can switch your mic off, thank you for that. Okay, I see a question from Mohamed Lockhart. Uh, Mohamed, please uh, switch on your mic uh, and ask your question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Chris, for putting together this webinar and uh, thank you, Andy, for, um, for sharing your insights and taking interest in the country of your birth, obviously. Uh, my question to you is based on uh, the fact that you were involved in uh, conversations about 
taking over as ESCOM CEO a few years back. So um, what, what would you have done had you, take, had you been in charge? Um, what do you see for the future of the entity? And lastly, um, what sort of just energy transition strategy would you, have, um, would you have pursued had you been in charge? Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mohammed, uh, no, that's one question that I'm not going to answer today. Um, so I don't want to ask a hypothetical question of what I would have done differently to what Andre has done and g given his life and all his enthusiasm to uh, s since since then. Um, I would have I would have split Eskom up. Would have supported what Minister Gordon had said. Split Eskom up. Would, it, would introduce support the introduction of competition in the generation sector in South Africa, but real competition, not pseudo competition between state and entities. Um, and uh, yeah, I, that's that's all that I will 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 uh, allude to. There, there's a, there was a, a very clear hundred day plan, but I didn't want to talk about that. Okay, thanks, Mohammed. Um, let's move on to Frank Spencer. I see his hand is up. I just want to enable you, Frank. Allowed to talk. Okay, we put in your mic. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Andy. My question is whether we can envision a fossil-free future with no further fossil fuel uh, construction in South Africa. And, and I qualify that question by just noting that. Uh, entities like the International Energy Agency and others are saying that based on our carbon budget globally, we cannot afford to build any more fossil fuel power stations of any type. And, and this message is being reiterated by many other scientists and the scientific community. And also to make the comment that both the CSIR and a number of independent modelers in South Africa have shown that the least cost fastest way of deploying solutions to load shedding into our energy crisis is through mass renewables and storage. So, so the question is then, you know, can we envision uh, an energy future without any further fossil fuels being built? Thank you. Yeah, the, the foundation, you asked the question at both the global and South Africa level. Um, the, the IEA in May last year released its and I'm going to use the word deliberately, so-called roadmap to net zero, in which Fatih Birol stood up and said there needs to be no further investment in, needs to be and should be no further investment in oil and gas and coal into the future. Uh, the audacity of, of that report was that it immediately started to constrain and the world, the, the investment into those three sources of energy, which is still 80%. And the world has seen the very rapidly, the consequences of that, the oil price today is $100 per barrel, in part geopolitical, but that, that's not the only part, and, and gas prices have run away. So no, the, the, the pathway, every, the, the, the world as a totality and every cabinet needs to more carefully balance four considerations, Frank. The first one is energy security, access, and reliability. The second one is energy prices. The third one is environmental impact of energy. And the fourth one is the tax flows either into the energy sector or out of the energy sector. If South Africa stops either the further investment in the maintenance of its coal-fired power plants and or not build, uh, not implement some emergency measure, we will see the continued load shedding in the country on a scale that will ramp up from 2.5 terawatt hours per year to three to four to five. Uh, and, and that's my, my best informed prognosis of what will happen. Uh, I am usually supportive of the rapid expansion of solar and wind. But the, 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 the international planning criterion of one day of loss of load in a year or in 10 years for the generation transmission systems of the world are not yet supportable, in, neither in California, 
nor in the US, nor in Europe, by the reliance on a, a resource, a really great resource when it is great, such as in South Africa, is solar, and wind, which can achieve 40, 50, 60, and in the offshore, as was asked earlier, even 70% availability. You need 100% availability and no batteries do not, and high in green hide, batteries are not up to that yet, and green hydrogen is not affordable at $4 or $3 or at where, where it is producible uh, yet. Thanks. Um, I, I think maybe a good point here, because uh, I know Clyde has very different views to that, uh, but let's uh, let Clyde in now. Clyde, if you want to put up your hand and ask your question, I'm just enabling you now. Are you there, Clyde? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Hello, Clyde. Thanks. I don't really want to get into a long discussion here. It might be good to focus on the risk mitigation program. But just before that, uh, Chris, when I spoke about the overbuild of, of wind and solar, it's really a balancing act. You can either build bigger batteries with just the right amount of wind and solar, but your batteries become stupidly large then or you can build more wind and solar to, with, with fewer batteries. And basically you get an, a, an optimization cost curve. So you can design a system which overall is lowest cost with a combination of wind, solar and batteries only. And that was the thing. And that system is then designed to provide full security of supply in the worst periods of the year. And it de facto then produces surplus supply on the other days. But the whole point is that it's the least cost total capital cost. And so that extra power that it produces on those other days is available for all sorts of things like water desalination, um, green hydrogen, et cetera. But if we focus on the car power ship and the risk mitigation program specifically, I put out a briefing that uh, about a year ago now, and that said, we're short of energy in our system, not capacity. And in fact, uh, ESCOM, uh, the COO of ESCOM acknowledged that during a, a recent uh, media briefing, that we're short of blood in our system, so to speak. We don't need a bigger heart. We need a blood transfusion to stop load shedding, not a bigger heart. If there's nothing to pump, it doesn't help having a bigger heart. And so uh, uh, I propose that we that if, if the rules of the risk mitigation program were changed just marginally, we would build a whole lot of wind, a whole lot of solar and storage. And de facto, within that build, we would be able to supply the 2,000 megawatts from 9 o'clock in the morning, sorry, from 5 o'clock in the morning to 9.30 at night, and have extra blood in the system at basically about half the cost of what it's coming in at with the risk mitigation program. Of course, if had we done that two years ago, we wouldn't be talking about this anymore because we would have had that. So the whole point is that the intermittency or the so-called intermittency of wind and solar or intermittency is balanced with energy storage. And our pump storage that we already have in place is horrendously underutilized at the moment. In fact, we have to have load shedding often in order to fill up the pump storage. Now, if that's not an indication that we lack um, energy in our system rather than capacity, because of course, when you fill the pump storage, it then can supply you with capacity when you need it. But if you can't fill it, you can't tap into that capacity. So uh, I think the risk mitigation program nicely summarizes what can be done. It's almost like a little mini pilot project, if you like, of what would be possible in South Africa in the future. And what would be possible in a full systems approach is that we could be providing electricity in the 80 cents a kilowatt range instead of the one rand 60 cents a kilowatt hour range. And we could have done it already instead of messing messing around for two years with uh, with all sorts of um, uh, challenges to the risk mitigation program. Thanks. Sorry, I've been a bit lengthy, but uh, I, I, I thought the risk mitigation shows as a perfect pilot of what can be achieved in South Africa in the future. Tom, oh, thanks. Thank your comments but, there, Andy. Uh, no, I'm not going to comment on what, what Clyde has said. The, there is 
there's probably a difference of opinion between him and me about <clears throat> reliance on, on battery storage. Uh, battery storage will materialize. Uh, I, uh, I've studied the, the, the use in California, here in the UK, in, in, uh, uh, in Australia. And to be frank, they're not used for storage. They're used because, because there's, there is too little energy in them. They're used to provide frequency support at short range in, in system auxiliary services to, because to deal with the, because you haven't got as much steel spinning on the system. But I, uh, so I'll, I'll leave that subject, but I, I will just use that. Uh, as people heard that I would be speaking today about many approaches and I'll come back to Mohammed's question earlier. I, I sort of have pity for, in a, in a positive way, for the, or the ask the I'll ask and ask the question. So, who is responsible for the fact that South Africa has the worst load shedding of all G20 countries, G7 countries, the BRICS countries of the world? Is it is it the chief executive of ESCOM and the chief operating officer, or is it the minister for? for uh, public enterprises, or is it the, the Ministry for Mineral Resources and Energy, or is it NERSA? And because the, I hear so many solutions proposed, but that overall accountability and the, the integration of the answer, plus responsibility in a financial sense and in a power sense for it all, is currently so distributed that that there are so many think tanks and modelers support, somebody needs to take the decision and execute it. Uh, and it, we can always dream of a better solution, but it's not working right now and it should work. South Africa deserves better. Thanks for that. Uh, look, we're gonna take two more questions. Uh, I'm afraid we're not gonna get through them all. Uh, but uh, let me start off with uh, 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 Chesakulu Kaputi. Kaputu. Uh, Chesakulu, uh, can you switch on your microphone now? Are you there, Chesakulu? The microphone is not on yet. Uh, please turn on your mic, Chesakulu. Otherwise, okay, it's on. Please go ahead. Hi, Chris. Hi, Andy. Hi. Good morning. Morning. Please Thank you for it. that uh, masterclass. Uh, uh, always uh, a pleasure listening to Andy speak. Uh, mine is, uh, I think, a social political question, I would, I would, I would, I would say. And uh, it's like one and a half questions. I'm going to frame it into one. So my, my first one was uh, uh, just what would you say has a higher social impact, you know, uh, between the greenhouse gas emissions that are obviously causing the climate change adversities affecting people versus uh, the energy poverty, uh, uh, obviously the economic stagnation that uh, uh, most people are experiencing. Take the plus 600 million uh, uh, Africans in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, and, and then uh, the other one is one to speak to the issue of uh, a just energy transition, uh, where we frame that, uh, uh, obviously, if you look at the pre-industrial times, uh, uh, GHG uh, concentrations and post uh, could have been caused, obviously, by industrialization of the world. Uh, would you say that, then that uh, uh, it would be good to afford uh, the African continent an opportunity to emit uh, significant uh, 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 GHGs as uh, the first world uh, slumps in its uh, in its uh, 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 emissions. Uh, mm -hmm. The half question is uh, what what did cause the case uh, energy uh, recent energy uh, shortage? Was it a rushed uh, energy transition? Thank you. I'll, I'll answer the, the first of your, your questions. Uh, I wasn't sure your second one, whether it referred to Europe, the world, or to South Africa, but uh, um, <clears throat> so let me speak to the African continent for a moment, um, Chisakula. The, the, most, 
the most significant statement that I can make about the African continent's reality on top of the one that you made about the very large number of people who do not have access to electricity or to modern cooking fuel is the fact that Africa is being de deforested at a rate of energy consumption equivalent to 10 million barrels of oil a day. So Africa, uh, we in Africa, with a population of 1.3 billion going to 2, to 2 billion by 2040, have to bring an end to the rapid rate of deforestation. That will not serve our continent well at all. If that, uh, that's the first part. Secondly, Africa, and I say this to Australian, Africa has better solar and wind resources than most other continents, especially as far as solar is concerned. Africa should maximize, and to be frank, is, is beginning to maximize the utilization of solar resources in wonderful creative ways through uh, home systems, through microgrids, through, uh, through mini grids, and that should continue as rapidly as possible in, in part answer to, to, to that situation. And yes, Europe should cut, Europe specifically and the US should cut Africa some slack and India some slack. And India is simply insisting on it uh, in, in terms of saying what takes priority for us is whilst we are rapidly scaling up our solar, scaling up our wind, in the meantime, we need to give access as fast as possible, keep the lights going, uh, uh, energize industry. And if that requires gas in the main, because gas has half the, uh, the CO2 intensity of coal, then do so. Okay. And the second question, the other half of the question, Andy? Well, which is what is responsible for the energy shortage, but I wasn't sure whether Jessica was referring to the world or Europe or... or no, I think uh, let's talk about the world. <laughs> the global but, energy crisis, is that is that caused by taking on this energy transition too rapidly? Well, Chris, uh, the answer to that is the, the world has, has uh, tried to end the development of oil and gas too rapidly, and that has led to the price increases. That's very clear, uh, full stop. Yeah, but, uh, and, and also this whole, uh, you know, uh, issue with the Russian uh, gas and uh, uh, the crisis that we're currently facing in Europe, uh, how does, how the, is, the, is that caused by transition too fast or is that a political <clears throat> cause? Uh, that that is Europe struggling struggling with uh, with its transition and and energy policy during the transition period. And Chris, uh, uh, let me perhaps close with the following statement: that in in my life I have seen three transitions: the South African transition from the white minority rule to the ANC. Uh, I've, I've seen the transition of and lived in Russia for six years during the transition from the Soviet Union to Russia. Russia Plus, which is still playing out, and seeing Britain entering the, the European Union and leaving the European Union. And in all three cases, because I, th I thought that transitions could be orderly uh, and, yeah, could be orderly. I now understand that there was a certain naivety to that. Transitions are messy and very difficult. Okay, so we also need to know that for South Africa and for Europe, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good place to end the, uh, this uh, webinar. We're now half an hour over time, uh, but I think this last half an hour for me has been fascinating. It's enabled a bit of real interaction, uh, you know, with verbal questions and answers, and I think it's been very illuminating. Well, it remains for me just to thank you again, Andy, for the presenters, for the people who attended. Uh, we're all now looking forward to the budget speech at two o'clock today. Uh, this really gets to the heart of things in South Africa, the economy, uh, finance, uh, debt. And we're hoping to hear more about what uh, the Minister of Finance and Government plans uh, for, uh, for the restructuring of ESCAM, uh, dealing with the uh, energy and electricity issues in South Africa uh, and jobs and all of these things that have come into part of this discussion today. So with that, uh, again, thank you all for attending.
Uh, it's been my pleasure to be your host. And thanks again to Andy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. All the best.